Lots of mysterious noises again today. Right. Ah, nothing 10 cups of tea can't fix. Right, um, we've looked at the kidneys, we've looked at the bladder. It would be rude not to link them up with the ureters, so we should have a look at the anatomy of the ureters. Is that all right with you? I don't think I mentioned last week, did I? But look at all these lovely, new, shiny, very expensive models we got. We're getting more students. We've got more students. We need more anatomical things for students to study. If we're going to talk about the ureters, we should talk about why they're interesting. Kidney stones. Um, we should talk about where they lie anatomically, how they run from A to B. We should talk about their blood supply. And we should talk about their innovation. And we should talk about their general structure. Given what I know about students, the first thing I'd like to emphasize might seem incredibly obvious, but if these are the ureters, or ureters, is another pronunciation that appears, the, the tube that drains the bladder to the outside, through the penis or out to the vestibule, um, is called the urethra. <clears throat> Please don't mix them up. And we're going to have lots of words associated with ureter, ureteric, that sort of thing. Just make sure you get all those syllables in there, ureteric. Because if you miss one out, it becomes uterer, uteric, oh, uterus. Oh, you, you mix up the, ureter, the uterus with the ureters and the urethra. Don't. So just think about it. Just, I'm a student makes silly little mistakes in exams and costs you a mark. Okay, don't make silly little mistakes in patience. All right. Now the ureters are important anatomically because of kidney stones, renal stones, uh, calculi, singular calculus. Funny that, isn't it? Um, but um, these are crystals essentially that can form from within, well, from from the urine, right? Um, and if you if they get stuck within the ureters, then they might become ureteric stones or uteral, oh see that I did it, ureteral <laughs> stones, yeah see, so I mean you've got to be careful, um, in here and they can get lodged at some point along um, the, the ureter between the kidney and the bladder, bladder and they, uh, they cause pain and other things. Now these crystals that might form from the urine, um, these stones, they can form from, you know, they could be calcium based crystals, they could be uric acid based crystals, or they might be a crystal that forms from a mix of uh, calcium, ammonium phosphate, uh, magnesium, um, or they might form from something else entirely. Remember, the kidneys are removing things from your body. So if you get high concentrations of these, of these things, you can start to form solids, start to form crystals, which start to form stones. And as this is quite a fine tube running down here, it might cause a blockage or it might damage the ureter. And the ureter's got lots, lots of nerve endings that we'll talk about um, causing pain and obstruction of flow of urine from the kidney to the, to the bladder. That's the issue here. Now there are lots of factors to renal stones and some are small and may form and you never notice them and they get passed all the way out in the urine and you don't even notice that you've passed them. Uh, whereas some, um, if it does get lodged within the ureter, it can cause severe pain and it's classically described as loin to groin. So this is your loin, your flank. It starts off as, as, as kind of loin pain, flank pain, and then radiates or extends down into the groin, maybe towards the area of the, of the testicles or the labia majora or something like that, as it affects different regions of, of the ureter. Um, it can cause nausea and restlessness and, you know, it really can be quite severely painful. If the stone gets lodged to the point where the ureter enters the bladder um, and it goes through the muscle wall there, it can you know, irritate the muscle there and trick the, the muscle of the bladder into thinking that actually the bladder is full and you need to empty your bladder when there isn't actually that much in your bladder. So it can lead to this sensation of never really emptying your bladder, always need to, needing to go to the toilet. And it's actually a stone affecting that sensory feedback loop 
um, rather than anything else. It can also cause um, release of you know, blood in the urine, which is a sign of some soft tissue damage, isn't it? And a stone might cause burning pain when passing urine, that sort of thing. Um, it can lead to infection. And the big thing we really kind of worry about, I guess, is, is blocking the ureter completely and preventing urine from leaving the, the kidney and causing the, the kidney to, to swell and dilate as the urine collecting system gets swollen. There are lots of different ways of uh, getting rid of stones, which I'm not going to go into because it's not my job. <laughs> Somebody else's job. Um, okay, what about the anatomy then? So what is a ureter? Well, essentially it's a muscular tube. So it's a tube made of smooth muscle. You know, it's under autonomic control. Um, and it links the, as I said, the kidney with the bladder. So the kidney does clever things with the blood. And these are the urine collecting spaces here. These are the calyces. And this is the, the renal pelvis and the ureter collects that urine as it drip, drip, drips, and then passes it all the way down to the bladder, where the bladder stores it, and then you can remove it through your urethra, right? Um, it's a muscular tube, which is very handy because it means that you can still pass urine from the kidneys to the bladder in space. You don't need gravity for this system to run. There's a little bit of peristalsis that squeezes the, the urine along the tube. Um, uh, the tube is lined with a urothelium, a transitional epithelium, you know, just like the epithelium lining the bladder. Um, and essentially, you know, this transitional epithelium is a, is a stretchy epithelium, very important in the bladder, right? Because it changes in size quite a bit. That's why it's a bit special. But the fact that it extends up the ureters is important when we're considering, considering cancers of the transitional epithelium or of the urothelium in that if you have a transitional epithelium cancer it doesn't mean it's definitely come from the bladder it could have come from the epithelium lining the ureters and in fact the rest of the urine collecting system right what else they're about 25 to 30 centimeters long and um, we should have a look and see where they're organized. We'll have a look at the blood supply and we'll talk about the innovation very briefly as well. Um, it's actually more straightforward than you might think. I wonder if drinking tea reduces or increases the risks of kidney stones. It's a lot of water in it, right? If we uh, start at the top and work our way down, as I said, this is the renal pelvis at the hilum of the kidney. The hilum is where stuff goes in and out, right? And um, where the pelvis of the kidney uh, becomes the ureter, it's got a whole bunch of names. It's got the pelvico, it gets called the pelvico ureteric junction, the, uh, the uretero pelvic junction, pelvi ureteric junction, ureteral pelvic junction. You get the idea, right? People combine the words pelvic with the word ureter, and they come up with all sorts of names for that bit. Um, P-U-J is an abbreviation, pelvi ureteric junction. Anyway, you get the idea, right? So that's where it starts. And then we enter the ure ureter. Very important to get the right number of syllables. Um, then the ureter, it descends through the abdomen and it's retroperitoneal. So the peritoneum, which is you know lining the abdominal cavity, um, the kidneys are retroperitoneal, and the ureters run retroperitoneally down to the down to the pelvis. Now this muscle here, this is um, psoas major. We'll have psoas minor here somewhere as well. I don't know that it's clear. But this is psoas major, which is going to join with iliacus here to become uh, iliopsoas, hip flexor. So it's running anterior to that. That's forming the posterior abdominal wall. And look here, do you see these blood vessels? These are gonadal vessels. So whether this is a prostate, this is a male pelvis. <laughs> Um, so these gonadal vessels, in this case, would be uh, the testicular artery and the testicular veins on either side. Look, they're very, very nearby. Now, the other thing that happens is, uh, here's the inferior vena cava, here's the aorta, and as we get down into the pelvis, it splits into the two common 
iliac arteries and as we go a little bit further the common iliac artery is going to split into external and internal iliac arteries. The external iliac artery is going to run off to the lower limb. The internal iliac artery is going to go off into the pelvis and supply blood to all these things within the pelvis. And we also see then the same with the veins. We've got the common iliac veins coming back and forming the inferior vena cava and so on, right? So this means that as the ureters descend, at some point they're going to cross over these blood vessels at the brim of the bowl of the pelvis, right? So there's a, there's a brim here, there's a bowl of the pelvis here, at the true pelvis in, anyway. So you can see how the ureters cross over those blood vessels as they cross the brim of the pelvis and then they run into the pelvis and then run around posteriorly to get to the posterior part of the bladder. Yeah, it's got seminal vesicles and uh, vas deferens, this one, so it's definitely male. So those, um, those ureters then run around to the, to the bladder. Um, so they might, they might cross the common iliac vessels or they might cross the external iliac vessels depending upon whether or not it's branched by the time the ureters cross. Do you see what I mean? Um, now, the, another interesting thing, so when, when the uh, ureters enter the bladder, of course the bladder is a, has a you know, thick muscular wall and they run through that muscular wall and they open at these ureteric openings here. Now they pass through that muscular wall kind of not directly but obliquely and by passing through it obliquely as, as the bladder um, starts to develop some pressure within it as it starts to fill or maybe when you're emptying the bladder and squeezing the detrusor muscle to empty the bladder through the urethra because the ureters pass through the muscle kind of at an oblique angle they form kind of a bit of a valve so as you contract the detrusor muscle to expel urine that contraction actually squashes the ureters so as you contract the muscle of the bladder, the urine doesn't go back up the ureters to the kidneys, it goes out through the urethra to be expelled. Clever, huh? Isn't that a good idea? Um, and we can see those two ureteric openings are at either side of the trigone here, this smooth area within the epithelium of the bladder where the ureters end and enter the bladder, that might also be called the VUJ, the vesico-ureteric junction. Vesicle, vesico tends to refer to the, to the bladder, a vesicle, yeah. Um, VUJ, PUJ, but And there's the urethra right there. So that's the full path of the, of the ureters. Blood supply. Ah, now the blood supply is is quite funny, really. Uh, <laughs> I've got a funny sense of humour. Um, now, the the blood supply to the ureters is essentially derived from whatever artery or vein is nearby. So. The, the, the superior part of the ureters up here may well receive ureteric branches from the renal arteries, from the gonadal arteries, and from the aorta. And then as you descend down the ureters, you may find ureteric branches coming from the common iliac arteries, the internal iliac arteries, and as you get into the pelvis, maybe from some of the vesical arteries that are supplying blood to the bladder, and in the female pelvis, might find some ureter ureteral branches from the uterine artery. See, <laughs> told you I had to be careful. And uh, from the vaginal arteries and things like that, right? So that's the rule, really, is that the, 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 the ureters can receive blood vessels from whatever blood vessels, big blood vessels are nearby. And that makes complete sense because the kidneys and embryologically, and this is the third set of kidneys that you develop, the only set that hung around, the other two just disappeared off. But this is, uh, these, these kidneys started to form down in the pelvis and then they migrated up into the posterior abdomen over time as everything lengthened and that sort of thing. So as, they, as they've ascended, they've, they've dragged the, the ureters with them um, and Funky blood supply things happen during... Anyway, so as the ureters got dragged up, they kind of had to make 
best do with all the blood vessels nearby to get blood supply from them. So all those ureteral branches supply blood to the ureter and they all anastomose with one another. So the, the ureters are covered in small, somewhat delicate ureteral branches supplying blood to it. But it means there are anastomoses, there are links up and down here. Um, so there's some redundancy. This is feeling like one of my scatia tutorials. Maybe I'll tidy it up in editing. Anyway, nervous innervation to the ureters is similar in that there are a bunch of autonomic plexuses in the posterior abdominal wall and um, the ureters receive autonomic innervation from different plexuses at different levels. Because remember, this is all smooth muscle in here, right? Um, so, you know, it's not terribly clear cut. This nerve supplies the ureter, no. Lots of autonomic nerves get to the ureters from nearby autonomic plexuses. Um, now, um, the, so that's all motor, right? All motor to the smooth muscle. The sensory stuff going the other way, the visceral afferents um, running from the ureters and then kind of following the same route back to the spinal cord. And it's, it's the routes those visceral afferents take to get back to the spinal cord that probably explains the referred pain that we talked about earlier in that, that if you if you you know if you have a stone in the ureter fairly high up and it's it's causing pain in the ureter that's likely to be felt in the flank here because those nerves are getting back to the spinal cord at the same level as skin sensory stuff's getting back to the spinal cord and the brain perceives that pain to be from the flank rather than from the ureter. See what I mean? And then as that stone maybe progresses down or maybe the pain progresses further down the ureters, then that pain kind of radiates down to the groin, the classic loin to groin pattern of pain. All right, so that's, that's the innovation. Bit tricky to visualize. So structure, location, blood supply, innovation, general anatomy. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about, and that's um, that, that typically um, the ureters are described as having kind of three pinch points where uh, ureteric stones or kidney stones are more likely to become lodged. Um, the first one is up in the PUJ, uh, the pelvic ureteric junction. Um, the second one is where the ureters pass over these vessels here, either the common or external iliac vessels in the brim of the pelvis. And the third one is at the VUJ, the vesico-ureteric junction, where basically where the ureters enter the, enter the bladder. Those are the classically described three pinch points. Now, when I've taught this before and I've read around and looked at literature, um, that's looked to see where kidney stones is. If I remember correctly, I think the most common points were generally kind of mid ureter and at the bladder. I could be wrong, I'm just going from memory here. But um, yeah, I remember that seemed to be the, the most common site. So anatomically, one, two, three, but uh, in practice, I'm not, I'm not sure it's that clear. Anyway, that's biology, isn't it? That's the joy of biology. Okay, the anatomy of the ureters. We have now linked the kidneys to the uh, to the bladder. In fact, I've done the reproductive systems as well, haven't I? So, whoop, actually, I should probably do the urethra as well one day, just for completeness. Okay, right, back to my um, cup of tea. See you next week. Where's my cup of tea? It's over here.